We're here because for some reason people just accept that the sun goes down at night. And there's billions of dollars of solar farms around the world that get absolutely no sunlight after the sun goes down. He texted me one day being like, I think we can put these mirrors in space and sell the sunlight to solar farms, at which point I was in. I couldn't stop really imagining what it would be like to stand in a sunlight spot that we generated ourselves. The beam, oh my god! Oh, we got a flash! Hell yeah! Let there be light! Every year, solar panels are becoming cheaper and more accessible. Today, over 1,300 terawatt hours of solar energy are produced annually. But there's a fundamental problem. Solar panels only work during the day. At night, they're useless. It's also expensive to transmit power over long distances. I was watching this video on the problem of solar power in Africa, and you get three times more sunlight in the Sahara Desert than you get in Europe. And they were looking at spending $40 billion to bring the sunlight from one place to another on the Earth. And I was like, $40 billion is crazy. There's probably a way cheaper way to do that. And I don't know, I just started like looking into different ideas and eventually came up with the, the plan of just moving sunlight from right above the atmosphere to right below the atmosphere. And that was a lot cheaper than moving it on the ground. The economics worked out and I just like, kept pushing it. I knew Ben uh, from way back in the day in high school when he had his YouTube channel, and it's it's kind of like the nerd corner of the internet. If you knew about it, you knew, and Ben was always the guy who was building the craziest stuff, so I always knew that I wanted to work with him at some point, and then uh, he showed up one day on my interview schedule at Zipline, and since then, we just became really good friends. You do the math, if we burned everything alive on the planet, it would only last us 3.6 days at our current energy use. So we're just burning like billions and, you know, billions of years of old trees. And, you know, it's obviously it's going to last for a very long time, like hundreds of years, but it's not going to last forever. And it's definitely not going to allow us to continue to like double and triple our energy consumption. So we, we really need something that can power the world in a way that's super clean, that can just unload unbelievable amounts of power. And this is where solar enters the situation. So like, you know, solar energy has been around for, you know, since the 1950s it started getting really cheap and then in the 2010s it became you know one of the cheaper forms of energy as banks started to back um, solar energy projects and then in 2020 it became the cheapest source of electricity during the day but then the sun goes down and solar energy stops working so everybody kind of started forgetting about solar then and you know kind of looking to batteries to come in and you know charge up the batteries during the day and then discharge them at night and that works okay but the problem is batteries are really expensive and it, fundamentally it's a storage technology and at a grid scale when you're trying to power an entire country batteries really stop making sense we, we kind of come in as this other solution where it's like okay look we have these billion dollar solar farms they're gigantic they're out in the desert they make a ridiculous amount of power during the day what if that didn't stop when the sun went down what if all the sunlight that was missing the earth could just come down and power those solar farms up at night so that's what we're doing here so you just put a really big mirror in the right place and you can reflect sunlight down onto those solar panels and turn them on at night and we can basically just sell the sunlight as if it's a resource ben and tristan are working to solve this by building a fleet of reflective satellites to shine sunlight onto solar farms at night i filmed their first s3 episode just as they were moving out of their original office into a larger space it's my favorite model of our system. I think it just totally explains what we're trying to do here. So the Earth just rotates under us like this, and then we can sit in an orbit right over the Terminator. So if you're the sun and this is the Earth, we're just over the line of sunrise and sunset. And this is really the place you want to be when you're serving solar farms. Part of the reason is we set just like the sun does at 8 or 9 p.m. So we're not super late at night. We're not going to be bothering that many people. And the other thing is because the mirrors are so reflective, we're only letting up very, very small spots on the ground. So it's not going into places that we don't want it to go into. And then the other piece is the satellites work together. So one spot is actually a composite of like 100 or so satellites at one time. And when you do that, each individual beam is, is essentially invisible and you're only seeing the spot when it's actually on the ground. The performance of that reflector is everything. The reflector is how we make money, uh, the extent to which we can go from a tiny reflector in a spaceship to a really large reflector in space is like one of the key parameters behind how much energy we get down. We want as much of that floppy mylar in space as possible. There's a couple constraints that come into play. It can't be floppy. We gotta stick it all in a rocket. So you need a lot of that stuff to end up inside a tiny rocket. And we have to be able to maneuver it. We have to be able to basically point the reflection. So this is a map of like the greater Los Angeles area and that tape mark on the ground is our orbit height. So it's gonna look exactly like this. And we have little tape marks surrounding all the solar farms. So when our satellite's in space, we're just gonna be able to point it around and just like go from solar farm to solar farm, bringing sunlight to people and, and performing measurements. So just one satellite isn't gonna be a ton of power, but you know, after that we just launch more and more of the same vehicle and we can get a lot of power to the ground. And we're really able to enter into this space where the rockets have already been figured out. Like we don't have to go into the business of building rockets, which are ridiculously complicated. Like nobody else has really matched 
matched SpaceX in terms of the rockets that they're able to make and the performance that they're able to achieve. And it's like, like you can just buy a Verizon plan. You don't have to build cell phone towers. That's such a privilege. And the, like a lot of people don't realize that rockets exist and they're a privilege that we can just use. Like there's like, and there aren't a lot of people like coming up with new ideas and new ways to use rockets. Like there's not that many space businesses. Some people might be like, going to space is not simple. Like that sounds really complicated and crazy, but space is hard from the standpoint of you have to build things that have to withstand an environment that's really hard for us to understand intuitively around us. But if you characterize that environment, if you understand that environment well, it's an engineering problem. You can totally engineer things to function fine in space. The beauty of space is you can put things up there and they stay up there for a long time. It's not like a helicopter where you have to keep refueling it. Yeah, like it's you put this thing up really high and suddenly you have global access to basically any location on Earth if you design things correctly. That's completely magical. Because we're in space, you can access any panel on the ground with any mirror in space. This becomes a global service. This isn't like a reactor located on the ground or a farm located in a particular area. This becomes something that is inherently global. So that's critical to making an energy service that's way larger than just an, a national energy service. A, a key part of us being successful is making thousands of these satellites. Um, at scale. I think the analog I kind of like is cars are very complicated. We make lots of cars. No one has a need to make satellites quite like we make cars, but we do. My future vision for what we're, we're really going to do is mass manufacture satellites at a scale that we've never really mass manufactured them before. So low cost is by far like the critical metric. How much it costs to get a satellite into space and how much the actual bomb cost of the satellite is relative to the revenue it makes is the foundation of the business. Usually when you're at a space company, you're going for like the lowest overall program cost. And a lot of the program cost is in the people and the engineers that are actually designing the thing because you're only making one satellite, you know? So it's like the engineering cost is way higher than the actual part cost. But with us, that kind of shifts a lot. If we're making like thousands of satellites, the part cost really matters and the engineering cost is actually a small component of that. I mean, like when I was at SpaceX, we never, we never spent time optimizing for part cost because it, it was never worth our time as engineers. Like our time was so expensive, but the parts were, were very cheap. So we're kind of, you know, taking a completely different approach to that because we want to make so many of these vehicles. When we're considering solutions that are going to scale to everyone on Earth to power the globe for scales that we don't even fathom right now, it has to be something simple has to be something scalable. So a really big part of our solution is finding those first principles behind energy to make something that's the most scalable. Um, so I think we're, we're really proud of how, how simple the foundations of our concept are. A lot of our work is in math land, figuring out how much money you can make with each satellite. So, you know, like downloading the data set of all the solar farms around the world and then figuring out like, okay, when our satellite's here, which solar farm are we gonna send power to and how much energy is, is gonna be in that? And how often can we do that with all the losses included, you know, of the atmosphere, like when clouds are in the way, you know, the different spot size, like all the parameters, like we need to add all of that up and figure out like if this actually can make money and if people are actually gonna purchase it. I think that's, that's the biggest thing is like, we're competing in this commodity market where like, okay, sure, you know, it's like a couple trillion dollars per year, but like if your thing is not cheaper than every other way to produce electricity, you will not have a product. Nobody's gonna purchase it. This is the first time we've, we've been using a satellite to actually like bring something down to the ground. Um, but a lot of the technology that we're using to do it is already exists. Like yeah. it's what every single satellite uses. Like the stuff that we're using to move the satellite around is in every single satellite that's up there. We're not inventing some new kind of physics to make this work. We're not inventing some crazy new piece of engineering. Um, this is very much like we have to design the right thing and explore the design space. Last summer, the Reflect team performed a real-world demonstration of mirror-based power transmission using a hot air balloon. They attached an 8x8-foot Mylar mirror to reflect sunlight onto a mobile solar farm, proving that it works. This success gave the team confidence in reflection-based power transmission to solar panels. There's, there's a huge amount of value to getting to a, like a functional prototype as quickly as possible. The balloon test was that. like Getting to space is not super easy, but getting down to basically what we're making as quickly as possible, which is a spot of light on the ground. The balloon test was the way to do that. It was like three months of just not really sleeping at all, <laughs> like driving out to the desert. Like, I think we spent three days without sleep and then drove to Oregon. A couple naps. But... Yeah, a couple naps. And then like the thing still didn't work, like when we were getting the hot air balloon ready and like, you know, that's the huge flame on that and everybody's there to watch it and see it work. And it's like just sitting there writing code, stressed out, like <laughs> hoping it's going to come together. It was it was insane. It was definitely the craziest, most manual labor thing I've had to do, combined with the craziest amount of engineering. 
This was the hotter balloon robot arm. <laughs> this is what we mounted the mirrors to. We threw this together in like a weekend, I think. It worked perfectly. Like, you know, it's like super gear down stepper, points the thing accurately. We just strapped a bunch of electronics to it. Uh, the whole thing would fold out from under the balloon. We like did a test fit and then the next weekend we were testing it. It was actually a really hard problem to solve. Like when the hot air balloon's moving and you don't know where it's gonna go and you have to like hit this super accurate target, like, yeah, it ended up not being as easy as we thought it was gonna be. Originally we were like, oh, we'll just use like GPSs and like an IMU and figure out where the thing's got a point and that didn't work at all. Like we started doing some demonstrations, like, you know, you build up a couple protos and they just do not function as you expect. So you have to like, you know, throw everything away, come up with something simpler that uses like a new reference. And you know, what we ended up coming up with was, was really clean, but it took, it took a lot to get there. We ended up doing seven, seven tests. The spot is so small. If it's not precisely aimed, you're not gonna see it. We thought it'd be pretty easy to aim and you kind of see the mirror getting brighter and then dimmer, but unless you were in the spot, you couldn't tell if the mirror was aimed at you at all. It's ultimately a, a good thing about the service that you can't really see anything unless you're in the spot itself. So mirrors are specular, big surprise, but uh, it's, the, it's the kind of things you get an intuitive sense really quickly when you start prototyping stuff. You know, I, I got roasted by the, by the sunlight at some point. <laughs> it was crazy. It's, it's the kind of thing where like you would expect it to feel just like normal sunlight, but then you realize you're in the one in control right now. We, we really need to get something to space. The sort of sub milestone to that is making our first very large deployable reflector. That's something that we intend to do probably in the next four to five months. Getting that to space is the next step. Actually doing a thing from end to end and getting it performant in an operational environment is like the way I want to make progress. And when you iterate like that, you learn so quickly. So getting something to space quickly, getting light on the ground from space is our next big goal. Reflect is the kind of company that inspired me to start S3. Small teams of motivated people coming up with unique and crazy solutions to important problems with big ideas of making the world a better and more abundant place. And who knows, maybe one day when I'm shooting a nighttime scene with a UFO, instead of using visual effects, I'll call on Tristan and Ben to beam down some sunlight for the perfect shot.